We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. That's right. Welcome back to O'Reilly really Radio 146. This is uh, recorded Saturday, February 25th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I've got Daniel Atherton and Amber Besecker going through the news with me today. And um, if we make mistakes, because we are human and we do things like that, so how about you let us know and correct us at Podcast at gmail.com or phone it in at 470-222-6759. You can also text. I'll take those, too. All right, so some good ideas for a change. Uh, also, uh, listeners out there, if you have good ideas, go ahead and send them over to us. That'd be nice. Something, something current, something relevant. Because, you know, we miss things. So, okay. The EU looks towards a carbon market reform. Yeah, their EU ministers are bracing for one, one nasty battle over carbon, the carbon market. Um, this was back on, on, on Friday. Um, the bloc's 28 nations are pushing for an accord after... The European Parliament last week adopted a draft reform of the European Union's emissions trading system, also known as the ETS. Okay. The cap-and-trade permit system is the EU's flagship policy for meeting its climate goals by regulating emissions at uh, T-1000 industrial and power installations. I think that's 11,000. 11. Okay. My, my screen's a bur- bit blurry today. Because T-1000s, I don't think, should be in no, power no, or, no, that's or a, industrial centers. That would not be um, a good idea, sir. <laughs> it has suffered from excess supply since the financial crisis, which has depressed prices. Um, yeah. But EU nations are divided over three major issues. The level of ambition and measures to strengthen prices, how much protection industry needs to remain competitive, and how best to manage funds to help laggards modernize their economies. Hmm. And as one EU diplomat said, we are bracing for battle. Um, huh. EU nations need a common position before beginning talks with Parliament and the European Commission. The final leg of EU legislation on the reforms tabled by the EU's executive arm more than a year ago. Uh, the bloc is also keen for swift adoption of what will be its first big piece of climate legislation since it ratified the Paris Accord on curbing global warming. The ETS is the EU's main tool to achieve its goal of a 43% cut in greenhouse gases from industries and power plants compared to 2005. It'll be negotiations until the death, one EU (sighs) diplomat quipped. Another said most EU countries want a deal as soon as possible, but positions are still far away from each other. If they fail to find common ground in talks on Tuesday, the issue will be bumped to the next environmental council meeting in June. Delaying reforms. Huh. Uh, pushing measures to shore up permit prices are some eight EU nations led by France, Sweden, and Britain. Will be Because Britain hasn't enacted Article 50 yet. They haven't Brexited. So they're still at the table. Yeah. They back the Parliament's proposal to double the rate at which the scheme's market stability reserves soak up, soaks up excess allowances. They are also mulling a plan to scrap permits above a set ceiling and an expiration date to cancel surplus permits after five years. For our member states such as Germany, Italy, Austria, and Greece, priority is being given to measures for ensuring that the regulation does not spur big industry to relocate abroad. So, um, so hang on. What are we really talking about here? Are these permits to pollute? Essentially. The, okay. The, this, the, the, there's a number of things going on here. Um, since there is a push towards green energy, and we've seen a number of EU member nations start really pushing their green energy. Yeah. The carbon market has been hit hard. There is a surplus for carbon-based energy. Um, oh, okay. So that that market has all of a sudden taken 
a swift kick in Ghibli's. And they're trying to make it so, oh, hey, you, you, you're still profitable. We're, we're not closing you up. And at the same time, hmm. make it so that regulations huh. that are coming now to ensure that their promise at the Paris Accords holds true doesn't send industry elsewhere. Which is actually one of the things that the Republican Party is banking on. Hmm. The that Re- entire, we're going to bring more jobs here. This is one of, of, of their goals, is that the talks will fail oh. and be pushed back further. So then they'll outsource so, things to the United States. Yeah, since we're deregulating. Fascinating. This is a mess, and the language is so obtuse. You have to be informed. If you want to be yeah. part of the process, you got to educate yourself. I don't get run over by this process truck right here. Obtuse language is a theme it is. for the show. It is, yeah. I mean, reading through the, through legislation last night, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you, you want to be educated because, again, this... We are a global community now, folks. Look not, how easy it is. Not for long. If nationalism continues to close off borders with walls. Yeah, but nationalism will stand in the way of economies and... Money talks bullshit walls. Money talks. Yeah, that's how it um, is. So, no, people are, are, are playing up their nationalism, but at the end of the day, it's about who's getting that dollar. Okay. Wait a second. Why is this in good news? Um, because, <laughs> be, because at least this is being addressed. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. We're reaching, aren't we? <laughs> at least it's being addressed and the EU is trying to be proactive. Oh, okay. That's the good news. There's tons of bad news, but there isn't like... In this could be good or terrible. Oh, 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 crap. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm still not clear as to what the hell they're trying to do with these energy carbon coupons, I guess, or something. Well, they're, I trying, mean, they're trying to prop up in poor member states in Central and Eastern Europe, which coal remains the large share of their energy mix. Okay. To try and, and modernize their economies. They're trying to prop them up. They're also trying to get them to switch to green, but without tanking their local economies. So this is a balancing act. A desperate tr- balancing act. Yeah. In the face of transition. Like, again, coal's not coming back. Uh, There's no such thing as clean no. coal, folks. No, that's, that's a myth. It, okay. F- just to clarify... Clean coal does exist, but nobody does it because it's too expensive to do. So it doesn't actually happen and exist in the real world. Because it's too expensive, diminishing returns, they don't do it. So when they say clean coal, all of this is a talking point and it doesn't exist. It's vaporware. So again, that's it, here and abroad. It doesn't exist. It, if you truly again if you truly want to help people who are in the coal industry, what you need to do is invest in those individuals and get them retrained. Mm-hmm. Yes, we need yeah. to send them to re-education facilities. Oh, wait, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Saying, we shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Let me change my language on that. <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to give these people something else to do. They need a new mm-hmm. skill set. Yeah. Because in, it... Part part of the, our jobs problem here in the U.S. is there are plenty of jobs, but our workforce doesn't have the skill set to work them. Yeah, and I mean what yeah. what this comes back to is the whole you know higher education problems that this country has. Well, it's not just here; it's everywhere. Well, you this know, is the problem. Well, yeah, but but we're we're talking specifically about a lot of it's the, not American even... coal workers right now, if I'm correct. No, I'm also talking about the well, ones in Central and, and in Eastern Europe. Fine. If, if They have coal workers, too. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I, I was thinking 
here specifically, but mm-hmm. even broader, yeah, there there needs to be better in access. The tra- in the transition to green energy, which is a necessity for life to continue on this little blue ball. It it is, yeah. In oh. that transition, if you don't want to have a number of horri- horrific stories coming about the people who are left behind, mm-hmm. you need to put policies and money in place to give these people a new life, to give them the education and skill set so they can still contribute to the economy and still live. Yeah, some kind of like incentivized adult education program. <laughs> Kristen in the chat room took took my idea. Re-education camps where they learn to concentrate. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I love that. That's wonderful. But we shouldn't let that out. No, we shouldn't do that. Uh, that's bad. Okay. So, so I, I Andy, wa- I, I think you put this next one in. Well, hang on, hang on. I, I wanted to make a make a, a note about about the climate change deal and coal and all that. Now, this is all, especially with this article being about, you know, carbon taxes and essentially and trying to reduce carbon. If we as a species globally, magically stopped emitting carbon, what do you think it would do? Not much. We need to start taking carbon out. Global temperatures would continue to rise because we've already gone past a certain point and there is thermal inertia involved in our climate. So even if we stopped emitting carbon now and we stopped emitting methane now, magically those numbers went to zero, our globe would still continue to warm of the last 15 years 13 of them have been record warmest years on record ever 1998 was warm because it was an anomaly it was it would be the other of the 14 highest years on record would you care to guess when the coldest year on record was the last coldest year on record is it in the 90s the 90s yeah 19 or 18 <laughs> oh damn i'm going to say 1892 dan eat uh I will say, since the 90s were that vague, <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm trying not to go over, so I'm going to say 1880. <laughs> it was about 1915. 1915, 1918 was the coldest year on record. We have been progressively getting warmer ever since and not had a colder year since then. All of those songs about a white Christmas and all those those wonderful things are of an era that is gone that we but will never see again. But it's a cycle, Andy. This it's is a, totally normal. It's a geological cycle that we're not going <laughs> to live through. <laughs> I mean, this sure. Is, th- <laughs> if we keep going on this, this is a massive extinction event. Oh, yeah. We're... No, scientists have already stated we are in the sixth major extinction event right now. Yeah, we're in it. We're fucked. Now. We already... We are doing it. We are causing it. The the most we can do now is damage control. There have already been species of monkeys that have died because it's too hot for them now. Yeah. We need to stop. Yeah. And there are technologies that it's we're not, coming up it's with. It's not a matter of to stop. take carbon yes. out of the system. It is a removal. It is we have to move not to a carbon neutral society. We have to move to a carbon negative society. And stay there for a while. Yes. It's the only way to change the global thermostat. And it's going to continue 
to rise in temperature. You know, slowly, because these things are, are fairly slow. But it's going to continue to rise for over 100 years. It's taken this 100 years to get here. This is why you need to go into here. your town halls, folks, and hold your, your senators and representatives accountable. The, the problem is that their priorities are not where they should be. You know, no. obviously we think they should be in one particular place. But they are not... The benefit of the species? That's that's a long-term thing. They are going to have great, great, great grandchildren that will still live on this planet long after they're dead and gone. It is not their problem. Because, you know, there are some of us, we are not normal. Let's look at it that way. We are not the normal ones. We are the ones that see the, lo the larger picture and actually care about what happens to our great, great grandchildren. We are not the normal ones. Can and we that's make the Cosmos problem. mandatory viewing? How many seasons of Jackass have there been? <laughs> Point taken. Because there's one of Cosmos, and then one no, reboot. And two, then, two. No, no, there's one season of Cosmos, and then one season of a reboot. Okay. That's it. The message is essentially the same. And Can we make them watch both? That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Mandatory but, you learning know, here. Yeah. Actually, hey, somebody in the White House. Yeah. For, for, for Trump's TV time. Yeah. Put Cosmos yeah. on. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be nice. That'd be nice, yeah. Um, the, the problem is, of course, education. If, because we are educated in this. We know a, just a little bit about how the environment functions. We know the water cycle. We know how clouds are made. We know why the sky is blue and why the sunsets are red. We know these little basic things about the Earth. It's a globe. It's, it is a globe. It is round. With members of the Flat Earth Society. All around it. Yeah. They are not educated in this, or they're educated to a point where they think they know, and then they stop learning. And our politicians are elected based on not what they know as far as science. I mean, the, the fact that Justin Trudeau, you know, our prime minister, neighbor to the north, knows Actually, anything yeah. about quantum computing is a miracle. No, no. And no, being a politician. I, 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 I will I will say this. And going back to uh, our, our notorious RB, RBG. Um, <laughs> Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg, yeah. Um, saw a video of, of her in an interview on, on Friday. Early yeah, Friday. I, was, I was going to bring that in, but I thought it was a little bit much. Yeah. <laughs> of course, no. now I've gone on this tirade, so go ahead. <sighs> <sighs> National symbol of America is not the eagle, it's the pendulum. Because when it swings one way, eventually it swings back the other way. Now, I think that holds true not just for us here in the U.S. of A., but in most of the true democracies of the West. Because Canada had their Trump. Yeah, That was the previous administration. Yeah, They were talking about a, a burqa ban... And and yeah, lots of the reactionary talks yeah. of, of of rounding up Muslims and the pendulum has shifted far left from where they were. Yeah. That's why they're having. Well, it also doesn't hurt that he's essentially their Kennedy. Um, yeah. Uh, and but even better educated and and a Bobby so, Kennedy at that, not a John F. Yeah. Um, no. There's a reason why the world is enamored with him. Because, mm -hmm. yes, he is attractive, but he also is charming and he has a mind. Yeah, he's, he's art articulate and educated. Mind. Yeah. So, no, the world is taken with him and for good reason. Right. 
He is the counter opposite to Trump. But he he is he he comes from the pendulum swinging. Yeah. Which is the one glimmer of hope in all of this nonsense. If if you take nothing else away away yeah. from our, this episode, take that no. When it comes to politics in true democracies, it's a pendulum. Yeah. Because when you hurt enough, you'll change the other way. Can I mention <sighs> a, a, a good idea real quick that's not in the notes but just happened 16 minutes ago? Ooh. Or, came, or, or was released as a news story about 16 minutes ago? Breaking news in good ideas? Yes, please. Um, so... The man Trump just appointed as head of the National Security Council uh, called the job a shit sandwich. <laughs> no, 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 that was the guy he wanted to appoint. No, no, this is uh, – yeah, you're right. No, I'm okay. sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the second choice. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. His first choice called it a, 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 a crap sandwich. Yeah. The, the second choice hasn't really said much. Uh, well, actually, what he just said, apparently, with a meeting um, – with his staff today, uh, he told the staff of the National Security Council that uh, the label radical Islamic terrorism was not helpful because terrorists are un-Islamic, according to uh, people who were in the meeting. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So ISIS he seems is to, not of was Islam. That, was that Mattis? No, that was... Uh, McMaster. That was, oh, McMaster. McMaster, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah. I did no. see that. So yeah, that's that's at least a glimmer of hope that perhaps the uh, the Muslim population of the world will not completely side against us in everything that we do. Again, I don't know. I'm still he's a military guy. He 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 has done maneuvers. Yeah, where where we're fighting. He's also educated himself on on the opponent and the mm -hmm. culture. Yeah, and. Here's the thing. No. ISIS is about as Muslim as the Westboro Baptist Church is Christian. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the, the analogy I want yeah. to make. That, that's how Muslim they are. Yeah. They are not Muslims. They were never Muslims. This is about power. That's it. Yeah. We could we could get into a theology debate about whether or not what they say actually is Islamic because it's also the same thing with Christians too. It's like, if yeah. you're following your book, mm -hmm. just the book, then the Westboro Baptist church is closer to authentic. Yeah. It depends I know. on what part of the book though. The whole thing. There, you're the whole you're thing. Correct. Whole. However, in the context okay, yeah. of the other language that's flying around and how mm -hmm. that's being used to demonize right. Muslims who aren't radical over here, mm -hmm. I, that's important. It's it's very important. Yeah, the, this isn't a what we have. Thing. Well, what we ha what we have is a love for the middle. Universally, we like moderate Muslims. We like moderate Christians. Anyone that takes it too far in either direction is anathema. To themselves. To the own culture. Because the moderate Muslim universally rejects Islam. Uh, the uh, ISIS. Yeah. The moderate Christian universally abhors the Westboro Baptist Church. But a lot of them say the same things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's kind of, it's a really difficult argument because what they have to do then is they have to look critically at their own religion, and they're not really and big on can't. doing that. No, they're not. They're not equipped to do that. No, a lot of people aren't. But yeah, because getting entirely off topic, the nature of faith is the nature of trying to seek a story that helps explain the nature of your relationship to Earth and the esoteric. It's the seek. It's seeking answers to why. It's it's the answer to why. 
No, well, it's not just the answer. It's also a narrative. We're, we're our well, brains we like, are, yeah, are, like are set up to want stories and to comprehend mm-hmm. them. Right. Correct. Yeah. We are literally wired for story. There mm-hmm. is a book called that. That's really good. No, that that that's what mm-hmm. we're for. And the ultimate narrative is religion. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Philo- philosophically, this is why philosophy, you have philosophy nerds. They exist. They but do. at the same time, religion serves an even higher purpose than even philosophy because it is a series of stories in a narrative about the big questions. Mm-hmm. And yeah. for some people, they just want the answers. They don't want to even comprehend the stories. Mm-hmm. That's And that's the problem, is that they want the fast, convenient, easily digested answer. And they don't even want to necessarily... They, they don't want to experience it for themselves, necessarily. Right. They just want to know. Yeah, just so they will allow tell themselves me why, to be hand-fed something yeah. that's not even true to the religion they're ascribing themselves to. Right. Well, generally speaking, people, and again, this is a gen, just a general thing. Yeah. We have to speak they in generalities want, about entire populations, you know. They want to be led. In many they ways. They want, yeah. well, yes. No, they, 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 want, they want answers. They want it to be convenient. They want it to well, be simple also, and easily embraced. To, but they also want boundaries in which to live their lives. To ask for some, yes. To ask questions. For most. They, they want a framework with it. I mean, we, uh, most of us do. It, and it's not necessarily that we're, we're talking about like, they want to be told what to eat and drink. Like some no, Christians yeah. do. It's, we uh, like to have boundaries, even if we plan on crossing them. So <laughs> that we yeah. know it, it, they make us feel comfortable. I mean, it's in it's uh, early easier. learning. It's easier discipline. than a blank space. Blank space is hard to fill in because you don't know where to begin. It provides it a foundation. Yeah. It, it provides a foundation even if the foundation is crumbling and rotting. At least it's an area to begin from. And a huge part of early childhood education and boundary setting or uh, a d- disciplinary action even is mm-hmm. giving children boundaries. Right. Because it makes them in the end feel safer. Yeah. That's also something that we look for. And so people do take it to the extreme of they need to know what they can eat, what fabrics they can wear, et cetera. This is why people fall into cults, because it's much easier to have someone tell you what to do and what to think mm-hmm. than it is to operate on your own. Yeah, it's, it's the um, also in marketing, it's the illusion of choice yes. where, you know, you can have any flavor of ketchup you want as mm-hmm. long as it's tomato. And I mean, if even if you think about it, that's why we trend toward government instead of anarchy. Yeah, we we, we like there to be some kind order. of system yeah. with some kind of boundaries. Even if we end up changing those boundaries or moving them, we have a jumping off point. Yeah, we, we tend towards order as opposed to chaos, which reinforces the narrative of you know there being a creator that wanted everything that way. Which is why humans yeah. in general suffer from a lot of ennui and, and uh, anxiety and stuff is because the universe is entropy and we're basically fighting against universal yeah. law. But the, the point of, of what McMaster said and why it's important is because I, I, I think we've seen that ISIS, whether, whether or not Islam does condone some of the things that they're doing, mm-hmm. ISIS doesn't give a shit. They're, they really don't care about... Most of them don't give a shit most. about Islam. Yeah, most. They're of them, killing yeah. their own people. No, they don't they, actually give a shit. They well, want power, right? And that's a great way to yeah. take it by saying, "Yeah, yeah, this is this is Islam because we can use this as something that well, the people are already used to functioning under in order to control them." Let's take it as the cult analogy, okay? So yeah, exactly. because es- essentially they are a cult. You know, yeah, just just like at. the Westboro Baptist Church is a cult. So. There are members at the top of the of that organization that are simply power hungry. Mm-hmm. You know the Elron Hubbard of Scientology. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you get the other people in there that are true believers of the cause. Mm-hmm. And whatever they are told, that is gospel truth. That is you know truth with a capital T. That is what they're mm-hmm. going to believe. And those that you know, and they very well may be the basic tenets of Islam but taken to the nth degree. They're taken all the way. 
And then and, I mean, they then they they do the the same thing that Trump is doing, where they set them against their own. And we've seen this happen historically many times. We've seen dominating cultures come in and take from the old culture and revamp Mm -hmm. it into their own message to make the populace more easily controlled. We even see it in colonialism. Uh, It's a little different there usually because what we have there is a lot of the times – Christian missionaries coming over, introducing the concept of Christianity into a third world country, and then using that to make them complacent in order yeah. to get their land and their resources. Sla- but you slavery see it here with in the United States. Rome versus Greece. You see that mm-hmm. with Catholicism versus paganism. It's a it's yeah. a pattern that repeats itself, and it's something that's very easy to do because, like I said, we we at some level, most of us like frameworks. And when you take something that's familiar and you say, hey, well, as a courtesy, we're going to keep these things or like this, we're going to make this look similar enough to you, what you've you already increase, lived under. You can keep your Yuletide. We're just calling it Christmas now. Exactly. You can still do the same thing that your grandparents did. No problem. It's fine. You, you appeal yeah. to them through what's familiar. And this is something that's also really important in storytelling in general is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel and you shouldn't. You shouldn't come up with something that's completely alien because most people won't be able to identify it with it. You'll what rejected, you do yeah. is you take something that's familiar and you make it just different enough that it piques interest. Yes. And that's why we have ISIS, and that's why we have the the Tea Party, and that's why we have mm-hmm. even the Westboro Baptist Church. We, you know, they're, and and the, and the entire Protestant Reformation, thanks to Martin yeah. Luther. You know, the, and, it's just different enough. It's just, it's still comforting. It has all those basic exactly. things that we're used to, but well, those things that you were kind of questioning before, you know, you know we've gone ahead and done away with those, and, and here you can well, do this. And, and yeah. that's why we why political moderates can be such a problem is because they're seeing something that's familiar to them, Mm -hmm. but is slightly different. So they kind of fall back instinctively on, well, but you know, it's still, I I still feel comfortable with conservatism. Yeah. Yeah. I still feel comfortable with these other things. So I don't really think it's that different and it takes them a really long time to come around. This is something that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about a lot with the white moderate and how the white moderate was way more of a danger to black people during the civil rights movement than the KKK were or openly racist people was because ideologically you never could tell exactly where they stood because they were still falling back on, well, tradition yeah. essentially yeah. versus they had moved you know, a little bit forward, but they still right. had all the, all the chains holding them back to the, the same basic thing that was the problem to begin with. And the moderate could make racism palatable right. because they were able to be like, well, yeah, some of these things are bad, but the core of it is still okay or whatever. And they come up with solutions like, you know, it's not like they're murdering them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's where, that's where we are. We've just in the last, you know, 15 minutes or so explained 2017 and why nothing matters. Yep. So, and man, we just can't have good things. We can't have nice things, can we? We just immediately take them to this place. We really did. We really. <laughs> so, how about some sweeter sex? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's a good idea. Uh-huh. Oh gosh. Okay. So, a counselor. Screw easy transitions. Yeah. There's no. No. Just rip the bandaid off. Um, yep. Yeah. Oh, a, ch- a counselor for the town of um, Overtorne wants Swedes in his town to take a one-hour paid break from work to go home and have sex, according to the Swedish paper, The Local. The Local. The Local. That's that's <laughs> the name of the paper. It's the local paper. It is the local it's local the paper. Local. Yeah. Um, I want even ha- to I have a link, actually, to The Local. local. It's uh, the local. An hourly local. An hourly local. Mm. <laughs> Is that what they're going to call it now? Um, and then return to work. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a it's a fun thing here. Let me uh, let me pull up the uh, the imagery. So yeah, I, I don't think you need to pull that up. 
Oh, come on. It's risque, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> Uh, not only are they known for the or office FICA breaks, uh, you know, coffee, coffee breaks, and generous parental leave, now Swedes in town, in a town in northern Sweden, could be offered the chance to have sex during work hours without losing any pay. <laughs> um, it's about having I better think, relationships. The, I, I, I think that would fly here, yeah. except with the corporate overlords. Exactly, yeah. The, there are studies that show sex is healthy. Uh, per Eric Muskaus, a 42-year-old city councilor for the town of Overtorne, uh, told the AFP news agency after presenting the motion. Uh, I said couples were not spending you. enough time with each other in today's society. He noted there was no way to verify that employees do not use their hour for other purposes than spending time with their partner or spouses. Uh, quote, you can't guarantee what, that a worker doesn't go out for a walk instead. <laughs> you cannot guarantee they go home and stoop. That's right. This is a dude who wants to fuck one of his aides on company time <laughs> and get paid. And get paid. Uh, this is what this is. This is some afternoon delight right here with his secretary. Well, not not, not just secretary. I, I I love all the women. All the women. Why is he Russian? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do He's not a have a good Swedish accent. I'm sorry. Um, no, cannot do it. If, Just if we did, if we did, it would be it'd be the Swedish chef from up. I was going to say the Swedish chef. That'd be all there was, and there you go. So um, after the Finns and the French, uh, Swedish full time employees worked the least in Europe with only 1,685 hours on average in wow. 2015, according to a study by Economic Research Institute, uh, Co-Alexode. And um, they're still perfectly productive. Brits worked on average 1,900 hours and Germans uh, 1,847 hours in, in 2015. I don't know how many hours I have worked but I know that it's more than that. Yeah. yeah I can and, tell you it's more than 19. What's yeah. interesting is that there is a lot of um, data in support of a four hour work day being the most productive option for people. Um, well, yeah. The mind for, for, for most people, the mind can only focus on an unpleasant or repetitive task for three hours. Well, we're we're getting into the principle of workflow. Yeah, which well, just... we're we're getting a lot of studies on. Yeah. Um, there's some stuff from Rutgers, Duke. Uh, we're we're seeing some some other places come out with stuff here in the states, but it's more heavily studied. Surprise, surprise, elsewhere, um, both in Europe and also being now studied in Japan since they work incredibly hard, yeah. sometimes to death. Yeah. Um, high suicide rate. Just uh, just for a, for a reference here, I just calculated, you know, 40 times 52. That's 2,080 hours. Yeah. That's a full-time employee. So let's say 32. You're working 180 hours more than the British. A 32-hour work week is a little shorter than what, uh, than what the Swedes are doing mm -hmm. at 1,664. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now... In, in in a lot of stuff that I'm seeing, uh, slightly different from what you're seeing, Amber, uh, it's you can – it takes about an hour to, to – half an hour to an hour to achieve flow. Mm -hmm. And then you I can maintain much. flow for four to six hours. So you're looking at a five to, to seven-hour day. And I know in a lot of places in Europe, they have a 35-hour work week, Germany mm -hmm. being one of them. Um, I also know just, okay, for, for me and my current health issues, mm -hmm. I, am, I am pretty much forced to take Fridays off due to needing a time during the week just to see my physicians. Okay. A, a regular time of the week that that can be scheduled so it's not constantly disrupting the work week. That makes sense. Yeah. So, 
for me in, in my, my personal health, I'm doing, you know, a, a, a 32 hour week. So they're doing, they're doing the standard eight hours a day, not a, not a 10 yeah. hour. Cause so, four tens is a thing. 10 tens is a thing. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm doing, I'm doing 32. I routinely run five tens. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I just did. It's like okay. Well, let's see. Fifty two times fifty two. Oh, that's two thousand seven hundred and four hours. Yeah, that's my life. <sighs> that's not healthy. No. <laughs> and we have the science to back it up. Oh no! What's really not healthy is that I also spend about six hours a day driving <sighs> during that. So I am sitting all that time. Yeah. No, but. Yeah, it's definitely not a healthy job, but it's uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, you're going down to a six-hour workday would increase productivity. One, a big one, mm-hmm. and for those for those who like the fam the the family values argument, for those family values conservatives out there, yep, you want to spend time with your family, right? And you want other families to spend time together, correct? Yes. And you want mom and dad to help with homework, right? Well, of course. That's that's a given. So, how about we cut down to a 30-hour work week so you have the hours to spend with family? And, oh. No, that's outrageous. Sca- that, would, that would hurt the business. That would hurt capitalism, no, blah, 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 blah. It won't hurt the business because I can show you a wonderful place over in Cali that went down to a five-hour day. We don't trust people in California. They're all smoking the reefer. Yeah, but when you're taking a a surfboard business and going from it being, you know, making a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year to a multi-million dollar business by cutting back on hours... And making everybody's salary, there's something working there. Yeah. There are ideas. There are some wonderful ideas out there. And we would it'd be nice if we could actually have more companies feel that they can get out of the this typical rut of, of doing things on a, a regular level. But you know Well no, here's the thing. Yeah. You can and it's more profitable. Yeah, but not you all. You want to make you want to make all that. the money. You want to make all the money? This is how you make all the money. But here's the problem with that. That is a private company, isn't it? Yeah. They can do that. When it comes to a shareholder driven public company, they don't care about people at all. It's all about the bottom line. It's not it's not even caring about people. It's increasing their bottom line. Yeah, but the thing is they want to see growth in particular areas because if, if you ever read the perspectives on companies and their stock and how they're doing, how they build their their employee base and the way they do their business and things like that, they there's a line somewhere about work-life balance and about how they're mm-hmm. happy employees or voted, you know, the top five or whatever, uh, you know, best companies to work for as voted by people that have a gun to their head. You know, things, things like that. And the rest is all about how they're going to drive profits. It's all about driving profits. It's, it has nothing to do with the getting the people themselves to deliver better for the company. It's just the company is going to deliver better. You are just a number in corporate America. Well, and you also have to consider things like it's cheaper to destroy one person by making them do the job of three people. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. But it's less productive and productivity drives sales and numbers. Mm, you can make somebody be pretty productive if the only other option is starvation. <laughs> Not, not only that, but not, large not in companies, the economic terms. Large companies, not, not in the business terms. Companies that have in excess of ten thousand people. Mm-hmm. Okay, the the company that I work for in, in the, as a day job, I'm not going to say their name, but they have forty four thousand people worldwide. Okay, and we are numbers in my department. 
uh, two years ago, there were 15 people doing my job for the entire state. That got cut down to five in an afternoon. In addition to that, our support staff that handle things like hardware, they were cut entirely, which means we inherited their job also. And on top of that, a lot of times what happens is when they make cuts, um, occasionally when they'll hire in new people, they they will lower the salary to the point where you need the job. Right. That That's why you too. see jobs that like require a master's and everything else and the starting mm -hmm. pay is 25K is because they know they can rug you, run you ragged because you're desperate. And you, your only other option is to, in this economy... Um, you know, a lot of times to starve or to end Take up in something such a bad. Less. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's a whole system that's engineered to be cheaper to the company and the employer in that they're not paying you what you're worth. They're not paying nearly as much as they were for the team that inhabited your job previously. Right. And a lot of times they have you working off the clock. Yeah. This is something that's extremely common. It was at my last job outside of what I do now. I run my own business now. But at my job before that, where I was a project manager, I would routinely watch our general manager walk into the warehouse and tell everybody to clock out and keep working. It's like, but it that's illegal. It was sanctioned by our regional manager because corporate would call every payday and be like, why the fuck are your warehouse employees getting overtime? There is no reason for them to get overtime. None. So they would walk out and tell everybody on the shift that was being replaced by a completely different shift that was nowhere near what they needed to be using, hey, go clock out and keep working. And it was mandatory, or you were fired. That's... A illegal. clear violation of the... Uh, oh, it's yeah. majorly illegal. But, you know, this is a company where I was called a cunt and shoved into a filing cabinet by another manager. And I had emails and a paper trail of his abusive behavior toward me. And I sent it to HR and HR said, oh, we don't see anything wrong with this. I'm glad you're not there anymore. Yeah. I am too. They tried to, they tried to move me uh, out of spite to an outdoor working area at a desk sitting in the unventilated warehouse surrounded by a chain link cage. As a project manager? Mm-hmm. Yep. Because by that point, they were sick of me. Huh. They there was at one point two female managers, and that was it. It was me and somebody else. She got fired for standing up for the warehouse crew. And also for making mention, we, we both got in major trouble for making mention of the fact that the ceiling above the women's restroom had been collapsed for six months, uh, debris and mold everywhere, and the general manager refused to do anything about it. Um, so there was really only one bathroom that could be used. Um, Just We got in major trouble for that. She got fired basically... She did that, and then the rest of her career was just them pushing her and pushing her and pushing her and pushing her and treating her worse and worse and worse until inevitably she was fired. They did the same thing to me, only I wrote an email that morning where I was like, if this is the way it's going to be, I, I can't stay here. And they took that as a resignation. Oh, and the regional manager, the one that... that uh, I had the altercation with yeah. the biggest smile on his face when he shook my hand and said, if that's the way you want it, no problem. Wow. So uh, companies, how many, I've, I've watched them do this. How many people in that company? Uh, I couldn't tell you. They're all up and down the East coast. Um, they've got some West coast facilities now. I mm. think um, they are a consistent problem with their biggest client. Um, they were, they were a company that handled extremely important products like uh, infusion therapy for cancer patients and who would routinely fuck that up by not having any type of storage facility that was air-conditioned or refrigerated. The product would go bad. 
Um, we would have time commit deliveries for 3 p.m. because that's when the nurse would be there to administer to the patient that we would deliver, you know, six hours late, nine o'clock in the evening. Yeah. And one of the, the biggest structural problems was that um, management on my level, the actual project managers who were actually overseeing these accounts directly, like we were the point of contact. We dealt with the drivers who were handling this kind of stuff. We had exactly zero authority except to get yelled at for the failures of the people above us. We couldn't fire anybody. We had no ability to discipline anyone. We, we tried writing people up, but management wouldn't approve it. We, there was nothing we could do. I was not allowed to wow. take a time commit driver and pull them from something that they were doing that was not time commit and tell them you deliver that fucking medication. I wasn't allowed to do that. Nobody was. Wow. But they're a nice, cheap option because all of their actual employees that do the, the delivering mm -hmm. are independent contractors. Oh. So they're and a nice, cheap option. Welcome to right-to-work states, where we have mm -hmm. the right to fire you and so that you can't work. And with independent contractors, they have no rights whatsoever. No. No. None. No. So, I mean, I've seen this happen as a manager, I, I've seen companies work this way and make shit tons of money off of it. I was working at the end, I was working 12 to 18 hour shifts and I was salaried. So there was no overtime for me. Right. Yeah. Um, and I would watch them walk up to hourly employees and say, clock out and go back to work. And they'd be there two, three hours extended past their, their uh, clock out time. And if anybody ended up going over for any reason, they got uh, written up. There was disciplinary action. Total Department of Labor whistleblower kind of stuff needs to happen. But there. nobody, it was highly discouraged through of things we course. had seen happen to other people. Yeah. That anyone would say anything. You should have called uh, all of them on your way out. Considering a lot of our drivers were um, of questionable immigration status. Ah. Oh, so no one wanted to say anything, um, and the people oh. who did uh, were summarily fired, and it just—I <sighs> mean, we've talked about this before. That when you when you wow. feel powerless already, you're not likely to yeah. go up against a big company because their legal team versus what you can afford isn't necessarily, yeah. yeah so yeah, but you you can't afford to. Oh. Oh, uh, Mo in the chat room saying, I used to work for those extra hours all the time. OT never approved. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, so, so much for good ideas. We're not good at the good ideas, are we? Um, well, we, we, we got show. some good news. VW set the cap on executive pay. Oh, really? Oh, shit. Yeah. How uh, how good is is that executive pay now? Still better than anything I could possibly hope for. <laughs> Still yeah. staggeringly large numbers. Oh, so, okay. Let's see. So let's look at this one real quick here, and then we'll move right along. Under new new rules, pay will reflect financial performance more closely. Chief executive package will be limited to ten million euros. Uh huh. Yeah, limited to ten million euros. That's actually quite small, quite modest compared to many. With a 5.5 .5 million euro cap for other board members. Okay. So, good. Good to see that they're, they're cracking down. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just going to move right along. Uh, Japan protests Russian military buildup. Well, yes, that's that's a good idea for them to do. <laughs> uh, I have to applaud that. Um, is there something special about this other than yay? Uh, th this is where I go, well, this is good, but there's also some bad here. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Okay. So, yeah, I, good. I, just, good I, I have to rain on all the parades. Good today. they're protesting. Uh, good that it's international attention. Okay, so what's the bad news? Okay, well... Um, this is now going to be the, I, so what's the bad news <laughs> segment? Okay. Oh, God. so mm. right, right, right now, um, 
Japan is, is voicing uh, anger over con- continued Russian aggression over its plans to boost troop strength on disputed territories, disputed islands. Yeah. Uh, Japan's top government spokesman said on, on Thursday, the latest move in a territorial role that has overshadowed ties since World War II. Uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary uh, Yoshihide Suga told a news conference the government was closely monitoring Russia's actions and analyzing information. Um, th- th- this is ahead of uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe and Putin meeting December um, to strike numerous economic talks, but failed to achieve a breakthrough on these still disputed territories. Um Russia continues to try and actually bridge a gap, but without ceding anything. Right. Uh, and doing a, f- a further look back and whatnot, it's the good news is Japan is still saying no to Russia. That's the good news. Okay. Um, the, the bad news is Russia is continuing to try and offer an olive branch, but not actually give anything, but maybe the branch. You can't have the olives, but here's this stick. <laughs> yeah. Whap. <laughs> that, that is what uh, Russia has been trying to do this entire time is go, no, those are strategically necessary. Um, we don't care how you feel, but you, we want to have economic ties. Yes. Da. Um, mm-hmm. that, that is the good news and the bad news. Yeah, and of course, so, Abe is really working to try and shore up any political ties he can as China continues to build freaking islands to take more of the South China Sea and, uh, and areas near Japan. Yeah. Getting ever closer. That, uh, the entire hedge money thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's that. Oh, fun. Oh, oh, glorious day. Oh, fun. So... Uh, just pull the bandaid off this one. It's done. It's done. It's done. Okay. If you've enjoyed what we've done here, and why wouldn't you? Of course, why wouldn't you enjoy the things that you've heard today? And you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways that you can do that. You can donate to the show through www.batreon.com slash O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O. That's patreon.com slash Radio to get early access to full show content when I'm not working 52 hours every week. <laughs> also, you can make that algorithm work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. And if you do so, please send us an email and let us know, because otherwise I'm never going to find out. Because uh, I'd have to spend those time, you know, with, with, I don't have... Try. Please, let me know. Use your words. Tell somebody else about the show. That way, it grows. Word of mouth, it's fantastic. Also, um, of course, you can engage with us directly. Please, send us an email message or uh, contact us on the social medias. How about O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com? Or if you're the more talkative sort, how about 470-222-O-R-L-Y? That's 6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. It's far too appropriate that we have now added that to the end of our script. (laughs) So thank you very much for choosing to waste your valuable time with us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work license under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0, United States license, including the Music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. And I think we'll, uh, we're we getting close to wrapping it up tonight. We're getting awfully close. Yeah. So stick with us a little longer. We'll see what happens. 